you know, they snuggle with you. We have turkeys that will sit in your lap and cuddle with you, and they don't want you to leave. You'll get stuck there. (laughs) Welcome to Task Time Energy, the purpose-filled productivity podcast, where we sometimes talk about time management skills and productivity techniques, but more often we talk a little more philosophically about how we think about time and how we perceive time and ways that we can use the time that we have in a purposeful and fulfilling way. My name's Scott Miller. I'm your host. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, everybody. If uh, you hear any ducks or cows or tractors going by, there is a good reason for that because we are at Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And we are here with Lenore Brayford, who is the founder and interim executive director and animal care director at the Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge. So Lenore, thank you very much for being here today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I would love, if, if, if you wouldn't mind, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your story and your journey and how you got to be here today where we are in this beautiful place doing what you're doing. Would you like to do that? Sure. So Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge is a sanctuary for farm animals who come from abuse, neglect, and abandonment. And so how do you think of starting a sanctuary like that? How do you get to a place (laughs) in your life where you think that's a good idea? (laughs) For me, it started in college. So I majored in environmental studies at Oberlin College, which is in northern Ohio. Mm -hmm. And through that program, I started to learn about the factory farming industry for the first time. And as somebody who cares about animals, I said, what is this? You know, not only is it affecting our environment so terribly, but the way the animals are treated is, of course, so awful. So I made some personal changes at that time um, because I didn't want to support those things. Um, But then as time went along, about six years later, um, I wanted to do more. And I knew that there were so many other people like me who do care deeply about animals, but who just are very unaware of how the animals in our food system are being housed and treated. So I started to do a Google search and, you know, figure out what are the different ways that I could be involved with this type of work. And I came across an organization called Farm Sanctuary. And I had never heard of a rescue for farm animals before, but I said, wow, wouldn't this be cool? You could be hands-on, directly rescuing these animals and working to educate people. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it kind of all began. And from there, I went on a journey of about five years working, interning, and volunteering at other animal sanctuaries. And that's where we met Mm -hmm. at Carolina Tiger Rescue. Yep. So, you know, tigers and goats, there's actually a lot more in common (laughs) than people would think. Really? Uh, Just in terms of some of the basics of what does it take to run an animal sanctuary? What are the personal commitments? What are the, is the physical work? What's some of the emotional work involved? Mm -hmm. Um, So I learned a lot from all the different experiences at various sanctuaries that I was involved with. And I just got to the point where, you know, you can continue learning all your life, which I certainly am. But I got to the point where I felt like I had enough to start the refuge. And so we were founded in 2012. And so this year we're celebrating 10 years of operation. Excellent. Congratulations. Thanks. (laughs) And and if you would, tell us a little bit about this facility. Tell us about like how much, how many acres you have and the number of animals you have. Could you share some of that? Yeah. So the refuge is home to around 120 rescued farm animals. Um, We started with chickens and turkeys. Um, We also have goats, sheep, ducks, and geese. And we just recently rescued our first cows, which is very exciting for us. It's a Mm -hmm. milestone. Mm -hmm. Um, Starting with the smaller animals, working up to the larger ones that, you know, cost more to feed, you need larger equipment, all of that. Right. Um, In the future, we'll be rescuing pigs. Um, And that's very important to us because of where we're located here in North Carolina. North Carolina is the second largest state in the country that produces pigs for food. 
and some of the largest factory farms for pigs are located right here in this state. And so there's a really big impact on our state on our environment, on the humans that work and live around these facilities, and of course on the animals. So we have a really important opportunity here in North Carolina to educate people and introduce them to happy pigs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're super excited about the future. Um, yeah. And one thing that will allow us to get there is we just got some additional acreage. So we started out with 16 acres that grew into 20 and uh, we were just able to purchase an additional 25 acres right adjacent so now we're a 45 acre sanctuary and there's a lot of potential to grow into that new space and welcome more animals it's fantastic and how many cows do you have you said so we just rescued four mm -hmm. um so it's actually a three generational family so we mm -hmm. have mandy who's mm -hmm. the boss cow and then her daughter, Mindy, is an adult. Mm -hmm. And then each of them have a baby boy. And they're, they're just two and a half months old or so. So they're still nursing. They're kind of in the transitional period. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's really awesome to have cows here on the property. What's one of the most interesting things that you've learned since you started this, this refuge? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know what the most interesting thing is. I can think of a lot of things I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one is the most interesting. Uh, I think one thing that I thought was true and has been confirmed is that these animals are very similar to our cats, dogs, and animals that people think of as pets mm -hmm. in terms of their interest in humans their ability to love us and want to be loved mm -hmm. um, really in all the ways that matter right. they're very similar um, and being able to know them on an individual basis and be friends with so many of them and have them know me and trust me um, has just you know really confirmed a lot of those feelings um, mm -hmm. that you kind of suspect and um, you hear about but when you have that really close personal relationship um, there's just really no denying it at that point. And so it's a wonderful thing to be a part of, but also it really helps me as an advocate because I can speak on a very individual level. You know, I could talk about the issues that, you know, chickens go through, but then I can talk about Dora and her story and what she's like and what she likes to do with her day and what she likes to eat and her favorite snacks. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's um, coming from my own personal experience and it's a lot more powerful because people start to realize that they are individuals just like us. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> it's, it reminds me of, you know, you mentioned Carolina Tiger Rescue and that's where, that's where we met. Mm -hmm. um, and just for the people who don't know, for people who are listening, so Carolina Tiger Rescue is not very far from here. It's here in Pittsburgh. It's a 55 acre, acre sanctuary. Carolina Tiger Rescue rescues tigers, lions, other big cats from the pet trade, from the entertainment industry, from facilities that have to shut down um, and give them a safe and comfortable lifelong home. And uh, I think when we were there, there were about probably s between 60 and 70 animals there altogether. Not all big cats. Some of them were smaller cats. But, and it's, it's you know, just something I was thinking about is, is, as you were saying that is being there around all those animals, the thing that stood out to me is that they each do have their own unique personality. Like they really do have their own unique personalities and are all, each one is very, very different as an mm -hmm. individual. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And I think, you know, for a place like Carolina Tiger Rescue or here at the Refuge, the educational component of what we're both doing as organizations, introducing people to these animals as individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, studies really show that's how you get people to care about an issue. You can quote them statistics all day long and say this many billion animals are killed every year for food. Right. But if you talk about flower, the sheep, <laughs> right. and where she came from and her story, that is much more likely to move someone than some of those large numbers. So right. um, very grateful for all the organizations that are doing good work for animals in that regard. One of the things that really impresses me about what you're doing here, because I was just thinking, you know, today, a lot of people, I think, when we're little kids, you get your little toy farm, right, with a little plastic 
the little plastic barn yep. and the little plastic tractor. I had one of those. You had one of those, <laughs> and yeah. you have your happy little plastic sheep and your happy little plastic cow, mm-hmm. right? And you think like this is where animals come from. This is what like where it's from. Or and then there, of course there are people, as, as I'm sure you know, who just have no idea where their food comes from. Right. Right. Yeah. And learning actually, it was a big. I would say it was a big surprise to me to really when I started learning about factory farming, when I started learning about how food is really produced, the environmental impact, right, which is huge, and what those animals go through and what they experience as they're being raised for food and for other human uses. That's right. I mean, most people, we just go to the store, we buy things wrapped up in plastic, we take it home, and we know nothing about that. But to learn about the farming industry, nobody wants to support animals being treated that way. Unless you have money in the game, you know, there's just nobody that says, I like that and I want to support that. Yet, you know, we are supporting that with our dollar every day we go to the store. So there's a disconnect there. And that's one of the things that our organization is working to try to reconnect people with these animals and to learning their stories. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, the, where our food comes from is a really important topic and getting probably more and more on top important as you know, climate change affects people uh, and having an informed discussion about that, you know, whatever, whatever your opinions may be, being able to have an informed discussion about it is mm-hmm. super important. Yeah. Shifting and, you know, to, to why I thought it would be so interesting to, to talk to you and have you on our podcast I was just thinking about, you know, again, Carolina Tiger Rescue. It sounds like such a cool place to be. And it really was, you know, it was a really cool place to work. We were a no-contact facility, so it's not like we were going in and, you know, scratching the tigers behind the neck or anything like that. You know, it was um, very professionally run. But it's fun, but it's hard work. It's heavy, sweaty, dirty, stinky, messy, you know, outside working in the summer in 100-degree heat and in the winter in freezing rain. It's really hard work. And one of the things I always really impressed me about you from the time we met was you were very dedicated. You were a very hard worker. You started as an intern. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so you were basically following the keepers around, learning how to do the work that they do. And I, I don't remember exactly what the details were, but I remember one day, I think both of the keepers who were scheduled that day, the, the staff keepers were sick. And I think even Catherine, our curator of animals who supervises the keepers, she for some reason, she was always able to just step right in and do the keeper's work. But I think for some reason she wasn't around that morning. So I remember, I think I came to you and was like, hey, Lenore, so we need you to kind of step in and, you know, do like all the work that the keepers do. And you looked at me for a second with a somewhat shocked expression on your face. And then you were instantly like, all right, let's get to work. Let's let's see how we're going to do this. Um, I was just always impressed with that, with your ability to step up, with your ability to work hard, your willingness to work hard. Um, and I'm sure that comes into play a lot, like here with what you're doing here. So I'm interested in knowing, and I think people would be very interested in knowing, what is it like to run a place like this? Tell us about your typical day. Well, thank you for, for saying that, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, it's definitely challenging. And, you know, a lot of the things you just mentioned, you know, that you saw going down at the tiger rescue, it's the same with any kind of animal you're working with. These animals are depending on us and they need to be fed. And in terms of, you know, the animals that I work with, most of them need to be tucked into bed every night for safety and Mm -hmm. let out in the morning so they can start their day. So it's a lot of physical work that is just necessary for them to have their best life. Mm -hmm. Um, And the work is also very emotional, um, especially with a lot of the species that we work with. They were specifically designed for the food industry in one way or another, and that can impact their health, their lifespan, and it can lead to a much shorter life than you would hope them, that they would have. Mm-hmm. And so experiencing loss on a regular basis is something that we definitely go through here. And, you know, at the Tiger Rescue and at several other sanctuaries I worked at before starting the refuge, that was one of the things I learned that, okay, this is something that you're going to have to figure out how to deal with and move through and still be able to get up the next day and continue to take care care of these animals who are depending on you. And it's not always easy um, because you get very close to these animals. You know, we are able to touch them and interact with them in a, a very different way than at the Tiger Rescue. So, you know, they snuggle with you. We have turkeys that will sit in your lap and cuddle with you and 
they don't want you to leave. You'll get stuck there. <laughs> you know? uh, all the animals can be so affectionate. Um, and of course, with, you know, health checks and making sure everything's good, we're always touching them and checking all the feet. I like to say from, from beak to feet. Um, but yeah, you have a very strong connection. And it's not just me, but it's the staff and the volunteers as well who form really close bonds with the animals here. So that's something that is a... A big challenge that it's hard to really understand it until you're doing the work, um, just how hard that can be. And not everybody is up for that. And for me, I found, you know, dealing with grief is sort of an evolving process. You know, how do I deal with it? Um, who do I reach out to for support? Um, it's just... I've, I've changed a lot over the years. I've learned a lot because you don't want to close yourself off from feeling everything and feeling all the connections. So how do you exist in that space where you could lose, you know, one of your friends any day mm -hmm. and how do you protect yourself from that? But at the same time, you know, <laughs> go about, go about your everyday business. So that's been one of, one of the harder things I think is, is dealing with the loss. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an amount of guilt associated with running an animal rescue because for us we're getting contacted every day about animals in need and you know i wear the hat of being the person that decides can you take an animal in or not mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'm saying no or i'm suggesting other places a lot of the time um because you know we have to be very careful about our capacity and you know not getting into a bad situation with our funding or our space or all of those things um, and so that's really hard too because you have to think well what if I had said yes to that animal mm -hmm. could they have had a better outcome you know maybe I should have said yes <laughs> and it's there's a lot of uh, guilt that can be accumulated um, so it's definitely hard work on a lot of different levels <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, I mean, that's one thing that I learned in the brief time that I was, you know, working at Carolina Tiger Rescue. It's such a, an important factor is we see and hear about facilities that overextend, right, that, that take in more animals than they can really care for. And not something that you think about, but that's a huge responsibility that you have is to be able to make those decisions that's and right. say, we need to care, be able, we need to be able to care for the animals that mm -hmm. we, that we bring mm -hmm. in here. It's not just a matter of money, but mm -hmm. it's a matter of space. It's a matter of the animals you already have and how will they be impacted. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of, you know, woman power. How many people are there right. that can provide X level of care for the animals when it, you start to get too many then that care level is going to go down and that's not good for anyone so yeah yeah i'm just imagining like you're out here working one day and somebody gets you call somebody on the radio i don't know if you all have radios here but like you call somebody on the radio and they're like sorry i can't come i'm stuck under a turkey <laughs> <laughs> it could happen <laughs> they'll be done cuddling in a minute yeah. um it's it's interesting to hear you talk about this and i think not something that people would often think about as part of of the work that you do that emotional aspect of it and I think it's so important for people to hear about that because companies these days, even big corporations, are becoming more aware of the importance of paying attention to employees' mental well-being and the emotional aspect of the work that we do, that we're not machines, we're not robots. So talking about the emotional aspect of the work that you do and, you know, the responsibility, the, the, the responsibility of being a leader, of being a decision maker. I mean, these are things that I can imagine so many people right now who have nothing to do with animal care and have never even been to a place like this can totally relate to. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what are some of the ways or are there any, is there anything you'd like to share about the ways that you have found to help you do that emotional work? Mm -hmm. for, for me, honestly, one of the most important things has been having my husband and my partner, Paul, mm -hmm. as an outlet. Um, he is an architect and works at a firm uh, in Pittsburgh, but he's also a volunteer here and he designs all the animal spaces and leads the building of all the structures. So he's very involved with the organization and he knows the animals too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm dealing with animal loss or some other kind of heavy emotional issue, just having that solid rock to... I'll go cry <laughs> to mm -hmm. him, you know, and then I have to come out and kind of soothe 
the volunteers or the staff who are going through the same thing that I'm going through. So that's really important for me, and it's been really wonderful to have that support um, over the years. But I think also being vulnerable with people, um, that's something that I have struggled with. But uh, the best tour I ever gave here was one, uh, I remember one of our first chickens, Fireball, had just passed away the night before from reproductive infection. She was from the egg laying industry. She had lived for two and a half years in a tiny cage. She finally got out. And just as befalls so many chickens, her reproductive system was so messed with by the industry that she had been going through this illness and she had passed away. And we had done a lot to try to get her back. Um, she was a really special bird. And I was giving these folks a tour. And in the middle of my tour, I just started crying. And I couldn't help it because I was talking about the flock that Fireball had come from and I was talking about her. And I was so embarrassed, you know, nobody likes to cry in front of strangers, um, mm -hmm. but I kind of like got over it and I got an email from them a week later and they said, we just like you to know that, you know, your tour is really impactful to us and we've decided, you know, we need to look into this. We need to not be eating eggs. We need to, this was, you know, it was so obvious how much you cared yeah. and it was so great for them to let me know that <laughs> because you don't always hear that feedback, right. but it was also a, a confirmation that it is okay, you know, to be vulnerable in front of people. And sometimes you can have a big impact and sometimes you can get support from, you know, even if you're the leader, you can get support from your staff or your volunteers because like you said, like we're all humans and we need each other. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the people that you work with are the ones that know and love the animals just as much as you do. And, you know, the outside world might un not understand why you're so broken up over a chicken but mm -hmm. you know the folks here know all about it <laughs> right so that's something that i've worked on over time and uh, i found very therapeutic is just you know letting your emotions out um and around people that you might otherwise not be comfortable doing you know you might feel embarrassed or something you might feel like as the leader you're supposed to be the strong one you know yeah, that is something that I think is, is it, fortunately, it's being talked about more and more among leaders, you know, in, within companies is, you know, this, this idea that we get and wherever it comes from that as leaders, we're supposed to be just like rock solid all the time, you know, poker face. And the fact that that actually causes a lot of conflict and a lot of the problems that leaders run into. And it's not necessarily what people need from a leader mm -hmm. you know that people actually respond better to leaders who are authentic mm -hmm. who are willing to be themselves uh and show themselves who they really are and you know we're we're we have that full range of emotions um, we're yeah. not just cardboard cutouts <laughs> and also you talked about you know relying on paul right and and how having people in our lives that we can depend on is mm -hmm. so important I mean, it's something you hear from people something you hear a lot from successful people is a they talk about the people that they can turn to, um, you know, for support and for for empathy. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I can totally see how those things would be so important in, in the role you're in. What else have you found useful? So, again, you started this You're the founder of this this refuge. How many how many people are working here now? So we have um, three staff members. We're about to hire an additional one. Oh, mm -hmm. actually, four. We have one very part time staff member. And many volunteers. The volunteers make our work possible. Um, couldn't do it without them. And we have absolutely the best volunteers. I mean, I, I will call a couple of our volunteers. Oh, one of our trucks, our many donated trucks is broken. They come out the next day, fix it. It's up on the road again. You know, all sorts of skills, all sorts of, you know, backgrounds. But uh, just just the dedication and passion is just incredible. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Amazing. How many volunteers do you have, do you think? We have about 100, about 100 volunteers that we see repeatedly. We have a mm. lot of one-time volunteers as well. Okay. Individuals, work groups, school groups, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your experience going from, you know, starting this place to getting staff to getting volunteers and the what it's been like to maybe 
go from um, being very hands on, I imagine, with everything and wearing all the hats in the beginning, I would imagine that's what it was like, to a point where you have all these volunteers and all these staff and you have to delegate things and maybe let go of some things that used to be more hands on for you. What has that been like? Yeah, I think that can be a challenging thing for a lot of founders Mm -hmm. because there's a vision and uh, a lot of people who start places, you know, are very particular about how things are done. And so it has been an exercise in letting go and it still is. And, you know, this year I'm very excited that our board is discussing succession planning, you know, Mm -hmm. like how will this work? What do we need to actually make this possible? Um, What would happen, you know, if Lenore moved to Italy tomorrow, you know, (laughs) what would we need in place? So, um, my biggest goal is for the organization to be able to be thriving and existing without any one person, including me, being a part of it. So it's been wonderful to kind of grow this organization slowly over the last few years to bring, bringing in actual paid staff, to bringing in volunteers. And what has really allowed for me is instead of answering all these emails or creating these volunteer pages. Now I have time to do other things that can help build the organization in a different way, whether it's reaching out to donors or looking for grants or thinking about the new, a new species coming here. It frees up time and energy in my life that allow me to continue to build the organization. So that is the thing I'm most excited about when Like, for example, we're hiring a new animal caregiver. The number of hours that I spend doing animal care is going to decrease a lot. And then it's going to be like, wow, look at all this time I now have (laughs) to do all these other things that I can really focus in on that I feel are important for the next steps. Yeah. What would be an example of one thing that you're looking forward to doing when you have that additional time that would be, you know, a big benefit for the refuge? I think donor relations is one of the most important ones because we do have this new 25 acre property and there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built back there before we can even start rescuing. So we're going to be launching a perimeter fence campaign. We have to build roads. A lot of these things um, require a lot of funding. And so I've been able to start meeting individually with people, showing them our large site plan, walking them around the property and kind of showing them the vision of what we want to build here. And so having more time to do that and to foster those relationships, I think is going to be really important for us to be able to help more animals in the long run. Yeah. And I'd imagine that's really beneficial with some donors because, A, they may want to talk to, you know, the person in charge. They want to talk to the founder. But also, I imagine that you have an ability to talk about your vision and talk about the refuge in a way that maybe other people can't, no matter how passionate they are about it. Yeah, I think I'm probably the person best suited to that. But, you know, it's great when, you know, certain certain volunteers might even get in on that or um, or Paul or board members as well. Um mm-hmm. What, if anything, has been difficult for you to let go of and let someone else (laughs) take ownership of? That's a good question. Um, One thing that I'm struggling with now is thinking about vet visits. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, I'm pretty much the only one that takes animals to the vet. Now, sometimes our goat and sheep and cow vet comes here and there'll be multiple staff involved. But the amount of time that it takes to take, you know, one bird to the vet, it's at least four hours of the day is gone because you're there, you're at the vet, you're back. And so this has been a puzzle (laughs) that I'm trying to sort out because on one hand, that could maybe be done by someone else and I could use that time more wisely. But on the other hand, there's a lot of knowledge that is necessary to be able to communicate with the vet and have a back and forth about what the plan of action should be for this particular animal. And a lot of that knowledge comes only through years of experience and working at other places, etc. So I've been working on talking to the caregiving staff more about, uh, you know, how to talk to vets and everything. But that's one that I'm... uh, I'm still kind of hesitant (laughs) to completely give over because some of those decisions can be really life or death. And um, when it comes to farm animals, 
veterinarians are usually, you know, trained to a certain degree. A lot of them come from big schools like NC State, where mm -hmm. they're maybe learning about chickens or pigs, maybe to the year of two, three, four. We have animals here living 10 years and plus. So they don't necessarily have all of the information that's needed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one that where you kind of have to bring a lot of your the old knowledge that lives in the sanctuary world to the table. But I know it's one that I have to figure out how to let go of and get more people involved. And also that can help through educating my staff. The more they know, then they're going to be more passionate about it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely seems to be a very common challenge among leaders of all levels is the ability to let go of certain things and say, OK, you know, I really need to turn this over to someone else and, and trust them to do it and have them take ownership of it. Um, I'm, I'm curious if there's if you know, because it sounds like you've done that with the amount of staff you have, with the volunteers, with the place, the way that this place has grown and just the number of animals that, you know, because I don't think you can take care of over a hundred animals <laughs> no. by yourself in one day. If somebody said, came to you and said, you know, whether they're in a nonprofit or whether they're in a for-profit company organization, they said, I'm really struggling with this. Mm -hmm. Is there like one thing that you would tell them that, that you think would be helpful? Like you said, one person cannot do it all, but also one person does not have all the good ideas mm -hmm. and does not have all the skills so what we have found here at the refuge is by giving volunteers a lot of agency and by listening to their you know ideas for maybe a new project we've gained so much more you know we have someone that built a memorial area where we can hang little medallions for each of our animals out of bricks he's a mason he's like what projects do you have for me mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's like you hand that over and then a beautiful thing comes out of it. So it's, it might be scary, but really by giving people that agency and having them feel like they're a part of your organization, you're making your organization stronger yeah. because they're passionate about it and they're telling their friends and they're, are, I can't tell you the number of volunteers that have brought out other volunteers who are now are a major part of our organization. And that is just a trickle you know, effect that can happen when people feel like they're really a part of it. So I've seen a lot of benefits to giving people projects and letting them take things on. And, you know, sometimes people make a mistake. You know, a volunteer drove a tractor into a fence post the other day. <laughs> but, you know, they're going to come fix the fence post, you know, so it's OK. Um, they feel important because they drive the tractor and that's a really important job around here. And we can't do it all the time. We have so many other things that we have to do. So. That's a big one, I think, is you're going to get a lot more out of it if you can just get let go of some of that fear. Yeah, there is that fear, which is understandable of, you know, if I turn if, if I if I let people take ownership of it, they're not going to do it the way I think it should be done. Right. Which is what <laughs> a lot of a lot of leaders go through, I think. And yet when you get past that and you just accept, yeah, you know, th there are going to be problems. Somebody's going to drive a tractor into a fence post. Right. That's going to happen. But the the benefits of that and the payoff and the way that people um, become more engaged and involved and passionate about things when they have that ownership when it becomes their work to do um, is such a benefit mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think if your organization also has a set of guidelines you know like for example our animal care program has many volunteers and we have you know here are the steps that you need to do make sure these get done initial them off very clear instructions, very clear guidelines. And, you know, if some issue does arise, then leadership needs to step in and address that. But for the most part, people want to do a good job. You know, they want to be a part of the organization and make it better. So I think it works out with light, you know, light oversight and guidance. Yeah. <laughs> and making that mental shift that you're talking about from you know, what do I do as the hands-on person to what really are my responsibilities as a leader? Where are the times when it's going to be most effective for me to step in um, versus when is it going to be best for me to let people, you know, handle things on their own? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to be respectful of your time because I know that you're taking time out of a very busy schedule to do this. I really appreciate that. There's a, there's a question that I've been asking people at the end of these podcasts that I'd love to ask you. What is your dream right now? 
<laughs> well, my ultimate dream is for the refuge to exist and for me to not need to be a part of it. Um, my short-term dream is to go on a vacation <laughs> <laughs> um, because I live here on site and that can be challenging when you live where you work. There's pluses and minuses. And, you know, as we've talked about through this conversation, this work can be a lot emotionally, physically, etc. So I'm really excited about Paul and I going on a trip. We're thinking about going to Yosemite National Park. And also there's a really amazing vegan resort in Mendocino, California called Stanford Inn by the Sea. So we're going to see if we spend all of our money and go out there. That may be something that we really need is a little break. Uh, and then I can get get back to it with a rejuvenated energy. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, there's so much I would love to talk with you about. I'm going to ask one more question before we go, because I think you're bringing up an important point. In addition to, to you know, talking with your partner, Paul, when, when you feel like you need somebody to lean on, is there anything else that you do that helps you take care of yourself and helps you, you know, handle the responsibility that you have? Yeah. Something I'm really bad at that I'm trying to work on <laughs> is if it's my day off and I come out of my house and I look around, there's staff and volunteers working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I might feel guilty. Well, why am I not working? Well, I should go talk to people or I should thank them. Yeah. But no, Lenore, this is your day <laughs> off. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've been telling myself, you know, to try to have that space for things not related to work, to do things that are completely unassociated with work in my time off. Um, because everybody needs that. Everybody needs, no matter how passionate you are and how much you care, you need a break, you need a disconnect. And so that's a good reminder, Scott. <laughs> I <laughs> good. keep telling myself that. <laughs> good. I'm glad I could help. Um, well, Lenore, thank you so much for, for joining us for this episode. Um, I wish you all the luck in the world and good fortune with everything you're doing here. I'm glad I got a chance to come out and see this place because it's amazing. I'm going to come back and I'll bring my wife. We want to do a tour. So yeah, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. If you would like to learn more about the Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge, if you want to know more about the work that they do, if you want to see pictures of the animals that they have there, if you want to learn about the tours and other events that they offer, or if you want to get in touch with Lenore, you can go to their website, piedmontrefuge.org. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-R-E-F-U-G-E.org. And I'll put a link to that website in the show notes for this podcast episode so you can find the link there too. If you are a founder in an organization or a leader in some other capacity, and you're in that situation where you've been wearing all the hats and doing all the things and being very hands-on, and now you're having to transition into a different type of leadership role as your organization grows, and maybe you want some help with that. That's the kind of thing that I help people with in my work as a leadership coach. So I'd love to talk with you about that. I'm also really grateful to Lenore for talking about the emotional aspect of the work that she does. Not everybody feels comfortable talking about that as, as you know, honestly and openly as Lenore did. And if you'd like some help with that, if you'd like to better understand that aspect of your own work, or if you're inspired by Lenore's story and there's a cause that you feel really passionate about and that you would like to support somehow. Maybe you're not really sure how exactly to do that. I'd love to talk to you about that as well. The energy leadership system and the core energy coaching that I offer are very well suited to helping you achieve those kinds of outcomes in your life and in your work. So you can contact me through my website, scottmillercoaching.com, or send me an email. The address is scott at scottmillercoaching.com. I would love to hear from you. So thanks for listening, and we look forward to having you back here for our next episode. Take care. <music>